A very warm welcome to you all. For those of you who've just joined us, welcome to the 2021 Global Business Forum Africa. I'm particularly excited to be talking about Africa being the final frontier, if you like, for investment. And with us, if you could help me welcome His Excellency Hisham Abdullah Al Sharawi, Chief Executive Officer of Oasis Enterprises. Welcome, His Excellency. I have Patricia Obo. Um, she is actually, Patricia Obo Nye is actually joining us on Zoom today, but she will be part of this conversation. She is the Chief Executive Officer of Vodafone Ghana. And then if you could help me welcome Rizana Zitta, who is the Chairman and Board of Directors, Renaissance Capital in South Africa, and Head of Investment Banking, Africa for Renaissance Capital. Welcome. So I hope you've started smiling already because you've come to a global business forum that's all about investment and you've got much to learn from this session. I certainly am quite pleased to be moderating it. And I'm hopeful that from your interactions at the event yesterday, you've started the dialogue going already. Right. So shall we just dive into it? Thinking through how COVID has destabilized the world one has to wonder what impact it's had on the continent specifically. With its multifaceted issues that have borne out of it, we want to talk how we revive economic, um, economies across the continent. So this session looks particularly at strategies for investment, what investors should be looking for, and how to go about rebuilding the beautiful continent that Africa is. I'm going to start with you, please, Rosanna, if I may. Talk us through the impact that COVID had across Africa. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe I'll start by saying from our perspective and how I think investors thought about the impact on different countries. I'd like to focus on the fact that I think lots of countries obviously demonstrated resilience because there's a young population. Uh, but however, the funding needs of African economies uh, have only grown. And we're in a period right now where uh, countries are going to have to be issuing a lot of debt mm -hmm. to be able to fund their way through uh, the impact of COVID. And we have seen companies raise capital and countries raise capital to meet that objective. Um, clearly, the second thing that we've realized is that there are certain sectors that have to be developed within countries to help us get through this. Mm -hmm. One is healthcare, and people will continue to be interested in healthcare. Number two is digitization of the economies. So I think for me, those are the two biggest areas where coming out of COVID, people realize the importance of, of those uh, two mm -hmm. sectors. And I suppose the concern typically is that there's going to be a shift of capital from the continent to perhaps more stable environments. Perhaps His Excellency could talk us through the perceptions of the risk that Africa bears because most investors might think, mm, of all the markets to invest in, I'm not quite sure, especially in an unstable period, that Africa is the market for me. Yeah. Bismillah ar rahim First of all, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, definitely, the perception of investment in Africa have been uh, having lots of challenges in the past. Some of it are true, but lots of it are misconception. Uh, the fear of uh, having, say, uh, uh, an unstable macroeconomics or political system, lack of funds, low growth, uh, uh, infrastructure that had lots of work to be done about, uh, accessibility to funds, all of them have been the challenges that people have uh, been uh, uh, concerned about in, uh, in, uh, in Af Africa. We have seen, though, there are certain countries in Africa that have adopted quite a number of measures of uh, reforms or tax breaks or cashbacks, and uh, they have been able to uh, improve both the FDIs and the results of those, of those FD, FDIs. The important thing here is that Africa remains to be a very high growth potential area, and it requires to be aware of that and take advantage of the other regions that have the appetite to invest and create a win-win 
type of a formula and solution in order to encourage more and more investments into Africa. Very good. And when you think through the statistics coming out of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, they talk about a 16% drop in FDI in 2020 year on year. Are there any specific areas that have been hardest hit, would you say, in your experience, Rosanna, and from what you've seen happening in the market? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there are so many nuances sector by sector, right? But um, a, a, uh, certain manufacturing uh, industries, I think, have struggled um, during the COVID period. Uh, I think that uh, within the mining sector, obviously, the sectors that are not ESG compliant are struggling, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I, I, I actually... Uh, I'm a lot more bullish on some of the investment that's taking place because if you wear another hat, there's been an incredible amount of investment into tech-led initiatives. So, you know, we, we are all aware of some of the fintech uh, startups that have raised money. Um, over, 200, uh, over 2 billion has gone into, in just this year, into African fintechs, uh, into over 500 companies, right? And uh, of that, encouragingly, we're starting to see also VC funds focusing on um, diversified teams, including women-led teams. Right? So I think in August, $35 million was raised by diversified teams. I believe that number is around $300 million now. So that for me is encouraging. And we're seeing like, you know, we have seven companies that have become unicorns, a billion dollar plus. Uh, early days but very positive because it shows us that capital is going to go where, one, there's a belief that the investors will be able to achieve the returns. Two, there's a belief that the sectors will be able to transcend some of the regulatory issues that uh, uh, are pervasive in certain markets. Uh, and, and three, they're addressing a real problem uh, and, and meeting a big client need. So, so if that is the general theme, I think capital will follow and money will, will be there. Thank you very much for that. Patricia, I wondered if you could talk to me about the telco space that you occupy. So with digital taking prevalence, with a young population in Africa, this is a space that people are really interested in, not only investing in, but participating from an entrepreneurial or creative perspective. What is it you're seeing in terms of the support perhaps across the continent for these types of ventures and the investors' appetite to plug money into them? Thank you and good morning to our listeners. Thank you so much for the opportunity. So I absolutely agree with you. I mean, if you look at the uh, median age for Africa is what, 19 years? Ghana is about 21 years. And their population is really expanding and with COVID, what we have seen is actually the surge in digital adoption, the use of technology in, in my business. I mean, traffic grew over 50%, and we have seen a lot of digital payments um, pick up so, so phenomenally. And so I think that with this digital technology being adopted, businesses that are getting are using technology, technology-driven businesses, those who are using payments, the technology for processing, are going to see investments coming through. Why Africa hasn't benefited from all this, I think it's really fundamental to the digital divide. It will interest you to note that almost 3.7 billion people don't have access to um, the internet, not because their services are not present, because they don't have the devices in their hands. And this is a huge opportunity that I think will help to leapfrog Africa um, post-COVID and even during this pandemic, because assembling devices in Africa putting smartphones into the hands of, of people who need the service will really close close this gap and allow them to use the, the services. There was an interesting statistics I saw that more than 3,000 apps are uploaded onto Play Store every day. And it's because now a lot more businesses are moving into digital. A lot more businesses are moving online. It was shocking for us in our business when um, most companies started going home and people needed, the awakening came that they had to do business online, that you couldn't find most of these businesses online. Very small SMEs were just not present. And we had to spend time to get businesses to go online, to create apps, 
to even know how to structure and market and brand. So I see um, create closing the divide with devices, um, providing the access to the mobile apps, and also the last one being actually the fintechs. I mean, 71 fintechs are already registered in Ghana, in health, in banking, in telecom, et cetera. And if you look at Africa, the mobile financial services solution, which we offer, is covering more than 50 million customers today. It's enabling businesses, and it's allowing people to access credit, um, to be able to do remittances, to transfer and send money, all the risk of, of robbery along the, the roads as you, as, as you transfer money and all that, is eliminated when you go digital. So I see three huge opportunities um, um, when it comes to all the transformation that we are seeing and the adoption in technology that is happening in Africa. Thank you, Patricia. And I'm going to circle back to you, if I may, and say that with the adoption of digital platforms, with the adoption of smartphones and everything within that ecosystem, are we moving at the same rate in terms of providing da affordable data and affordable access to the data that's required to run these digital platforms effectively. I think the story is different across the continent. I'm, con I'm, I'm quite curious to understand what your views are on this. Yeah. Unfortunately, we aren't. I mean, if I look at Ghana, if you look at the opportunity in terms of home pass for cable, I mean, in Europe, we will take cable in the home for granted, and it's just about which service provider here, we don't even have the cable in the homes, neither do they have um, some of the mobile coverage access. I haven't even talked about leave devices out. So, and it's very clear, if you look at the goal um, up to 2030 for the sustainability goals, there's no way the private sector alone or government alone for that matter can drive access into homes. The universal access we talk about has to be a partnership between government and the private sector to drive connectivity. Um, we, we are nowhere there. If you look at Ghana, we talk about mobile access penetration being, let's say, 130%. But the number of people who actually own the device and have the SIM card is about 50%, which means the same people have two or three accesses, and there are almost 50% of the rest who don't have access at all. And that's where the, the challenge is. That's where I think the opportunity also lies. Fantastic. Now, to ensure that our audience is completely plugged into the conversation, I would encourage you, if you do not have the GBF app, to please access it on your phones. We will run a poll shortly, because I'm curious and keen to hear your voices too, and I'd like you to be equally engaged as our panelists over here. From Patricia's statement, His Excellency, I wondered then, I mean, the UAE is very well positioned as potentially the smartest city on earth. You know, there's a lot that goes into the digital space. There are visions, national visions, that are designed to create an ecosystem that operates seamlessly. What best practices would you encourage for the African continent as examples of what's happened in the UAE that they ought to consider adopting? Yeah, actually not just UAE, it's GCC in general. Uh, GCC has been quite successful in the digital transformation. In both in terms of services and many other aspects of day-to-day -day requirements. And uh, UAE, per se, has also invested in the, infra the telecommunication infrastructure in many areas in Africa, if you uh, uh, follow the news, especially in the last five to six years. And without that infrastructure, all of the smart services will not be accessible to uh, the population in, in, in Africa. And the telecommunication infrastructure has been quite a big challenge there. Now, uh, when you provide the services, you have to tailor make those services to the type of population who requires those services. Is there is no need to provide them more, and of course it will be completely useless to provide them less. Uh, UAE has moved in terms of healthcare, in terms of governmental services, in terms of education, even things like transport or uh, logistics have been all, uh, all of them have been adopting digital platforms which will make it much easier for the customers and the suppliers to meet at the right time, at the right place for the right product. Uh, Africa has have to develop this infrastructure and align itself with the corresponding regions 
not just for the technology transfer and not just for the FDI transfer, but also to create a market for the African countries after these FDIs have been have have reached, have been used, have been implemented, and have produced. So uh, the best practices starts from the actual requirements of the population, whether educational, commercial, governmental, etc. Thank you, His Excellency. Rosanna, let's talk about the regulatory environment and the ease of doing business across the continent. As an investor, how easy is it for people to identify projects that are worth investing in and be able to access them without taking on too much risk or risk that would otherwise be off-putting? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm going to approach it um, not from the perspective of uh, a, an investor that can trade in and out of mm -hmm. of uh, listed instruments or markets, but people who are either uh, t uh, buying companies or putting up factories. Um, I think whilst uh, most governments are probably uh, constructive in trying to get investment in, uh, the issue, and you see it uh, in, in many large, sophisticated African countries, I won't pick anyone in particular, uh, is inconsistency of execution. So the best policy wishes are not followed through uh, with consistent execution. Um, I think you know the reality is we live in a world where uh, governments need to go beyond uh, what, what I can say are old practices, right? I think they should be focused on getting rid of rent seeking, uh, decreasing bureaucracy, focusing on you know, creating an enabling environment. Now, there are some countries that do that and do that well. Um, and you know, when that environment happens, you find that it is easier for corporates to analyze the investment opportunity and go to the boards and say, this is the reason we want to invest in this country, because it is not only an attractive asset that we're investing in, but they, we've actually had a very pleasant and, and constructive dialogue with, their, with the policymakers, right? Uh, I think we, we, that has not been a strength of a lot of our, our, of our economies, and even the more sophisticated ones uh, have political issues. Sure, sure. And Patricia, what would your response to that same question be? How enabling are our environments to encourage investment into the continent? I think that we should be more deliberate um, having gone through the pandemic, we can't leave it as business as usual. I think that the way we incentivize investors to come in should be, um, we should be deliberate about it. We should look at our interest rates, uh, um, the policies that we set around it. Um, we should also look at where we direct even new loans um, that are being taken so that it goes into resource generation. And I think the last but most important, if you ask me, is that we must start looking at human capital as almost the most important, because we saw the hit when, when, when the, the pandemic happened, that if governments invest, if private sector invest in their human capital, we will be able to innovate better and, and take advantage of the, the transformation that is happening, because we can't control it. It's happening globally. But if the people within your continent are not ready to take advantage of it, then you will still be left behind. So I think investment in human capital, for me, will be a, a big focus. Okay. So this is where I ask for your voices, delegates. Could you please go on to the GBF um, app and hit participate? Because I would like to get your views. If you could let me know, please, what types of policies are key to boosting foreign investment in Africa? This is a multiple choice question. Your results will come up on the screen as we keep delving into the policy issues. But please do let us know what your views are on the foreign investment policies that are required to boost um, inward FDI, as it were. Talking policy some more then. His Excellency, I would welcome your views on what the UAE does well in terms of creating a conducive environment for investment. Again, we're talking best practices. What can Africa learn for countries that perhaps may be ahead of the curve in doing this? Yeah. If you notice that UAE has moved uh, away from the old style of doing business to the modern style of doing business, and this is the biggest advantage that we have versus 
our neighbors, maybe, and versus many other countries, despite our limited size and, to so say, compared to much bigger countries' limited resources. It, is, it starts from the grassroots. We need to do what is required in order to achieve our goals. This is the simple underlying of any best practice of anything that we could do. Now, we here in UAE or in the Gulf, looking at Africa, there is a huge potential of growth in fintech, in telehealth, in the digital platform for farmers, in e-commerce, in logistics, in retail. There are, and, and these are just to name few. But if you analyze all of them, you will find that the underlying is the digital transformation. Mm -hmm. And this will enable us to be able to reach to the right people. Unfortunately, in the past, the, the, the marriage of the investors were not at the right one because data was not available and infrastructure was very, very weak. Now, with proper regulations and proper infrastructure, we will be able to, uh, to achieve those. For us in the GCC in general, what's one of the most important things for us is food security. And Africa happens to be the food basket of the world. So we have to really create a synergy between these two requirements. This is a ready-made formula for, a sec for success. Yet, we need to adopt the proper channels, we need to adopt the proper policies, we need to adopt proper regulations in order to encourage people to, to invest. And of course, that goes without saying, you need a proper infrastructure. GCC had invested in transport and energy, and UAE specifically has invested in telecommunication. So we are, we are able to create now a proper platform in which we get our food security and, of course, business flourishes in Africa. Thank you very much, His Excellency. Rizar? Yeah, I guess I'd like to just maybe <clears throat> add to, to what has been said. And I think for me, interestingly, um, our, our economist, Charlie Robinson, has put together a couple of pieces on some very insightful ways in which regulators could take a long-term view in developing um, the region. And I think um, if you look at the UAE, they have a lot of those elements. I, I mean, the number one uh, issue to think about is having an educated workforce. I think investing properly in that. Number two is making sure that you put in the electricity capacity. And I think um, having uh, a, you know, a renewables-led capacity. Number four, I mean three, is industrialization. At the end of the day, we have a great free trade agreement that's about to kick off. The only way we're going to get intra-Africa trade happening is if we have domestic capacity in each of our respective countries. And I think the fourth point, slightly more controversial, is probably um, people have to have less kids so they can save more. And if we save more, we'll be able to drive our own GDP growth. Very good. For the purists amongst you, I hope you won't mind that I keep referring to Africa as though it were a single country. We are talking at a continental level. Do excuse me for that. Um, as we wrap up, I would be doing a disservice to women if I didn't address the disproportionate investment that goes into male enterprises versus females. Patricia, if you could jump in and just quickly let me know what is required perhaps to lift the profile of businesses, um, the investment opportunities for women, where are they falling short, and what should investors be aware of in terms of their consideration for female-led enterprise? Thank you for this. Thank you for giving women a platform. You know, women are 50% of the population of the world. And if you go into um, the African statistics, it's probably 90% of women who are in the informal sector. So they are trying their best to do something, but they contribute more to the informal sector. And so when things like the pandemic hit, they are the most affected. They are the people who need the social protection and all the labor protection that's required. However, what we throw to them usually is what, the stimulus packages? How much are you going to give to her? 5,000, 10,000? That's all the government can do for small-scale businesses. This is where the private sector um, needs to come in because the business ideas exist. I mean, if they've been able to create that informal economy and it's 90% of, 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 of participation is women, then you can know that the business ideas exist. What they need is structure around how to boom 
these businesses. And it's amazing how when you put digital in the hands of these women, I experienced it myself when, when we trained women um, to get digital access, put devices in their hands, teach them how to save, how to access credit. You go back a year later, and this is a transformed woman who is taking care of her family. More than 10,000 households were transformed because of that program we run. And so for me, the, the mind of the investor should not look at the size of the woman's business today, should look at the potential that if I take this idea that exists, the capability of the resources that's available, I can brand it, I can structure it, I can digitize it, and that's the boom. So for me, um, investing in women, investing in ideas that the women are bringing, if they are making the purchasing decisions for their kids, and I'm sure all the people in the, in, in the audience will agree with me that the women are making the purchasing decisions. So why won't you allow them to participate in creating this ecosystem and the businesses that they need um, to service their needs and the needs of the homes and the families? And that is wonderful. Thank you very much, Patricia. So there you have it. We are actually out of time for this session now. I think in closing, I would say that Africa is clearly the final frontier for investment. There are a myriad of opportunities, and it really is about perhaps having the right conversations with the right people to understand what those opportunities are and to tap into them. I'd like to thank my panelists. Rosanna, His Excellency, and Patricia for your insights. Thank you for your engagement, and of course, to our delegates who participated in the poll. Unfortunately, I don't have the results to talk through, but we will communicate them to you, hopefully. Thank you ever so much for your attention and for your attendance today. Good day.